Hello, my name is Viren Sommers, and I'm going to be talking with you as part of the CME series on sleep and cardiovascular health. How, what, and why. So we've had this change from, from uh, uh, nighttime to daytime, uh, and the humans have evolved over this period and have learned that it's probably best to hunt, fish, gather during the daytime, and sleep in a safe place during the night. And as this behavioral change developed, so did, we think, a physiologic uh, accompaniment to that, and that is the relationship between the pineal gland, melatonin, light, and the induction of sleep and wakefulness. So what happens is that when you have uh, the, the onset of darkness, as the light fades, you have less light entering the retina and being relayed effectively to the pineal gland. And so this results in an increase in melatonin, shown here by the broken line. So the darkness results in higher melatonin, and the melatonin induces the onset of sleep. And as your melatonin stays high during darkness, you remain asleep. And then when the light comes back on, either artificially or by sunlight, your pineal gland stops producing melatonin, melatonin levels fall, and you gradually wake up. So this is essentially how we've, we humans have evolved to interact with the day-night cycle uh, that, that we've been exposed to. Now, as we've slept, we've also learned that there are other things that happen during sleep that are very important for cognitive health, for, for, for memory, for cardiovascular health, and for metabolism generally, and specifically brain development and plasticity, learning and memory consolidation, restoration and regeneration of physiologic and structural functions, and energy conservation are important factors that, 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 that make sleep essential to, to good health. And when we think about sleep, we usually think about it as a, a, a monolithic phase that, okay, we're asleep, and we're asleep. But it turns out that sleep is actually a very structured phenomenon, that it's, it's, uh, it's very heterogeneous, and that different things happen during different phases of sleep. We've learned to separate the different phases of sleep by looking at the brain waves. Now, these are the brain waves when people are awake. This is non-REM sleep, N1, non-REM2, which is deeper, N2, non-REM3, which is the deepest stage of non-REM sleep, N3, and this is REM or dream sleep. And what is striking is that the brain waves, the, the, the EEG and the eye movements that occur during wakefulness are similar to what happens during REM, and essentially the brain waves that are most important, suggesting that wakefulness and REM or rapid eye movement sleep are, are linked. And it, they are linked in a way because during REM, rapid eye movement sleep is the time that we dream. This is also the time we found out that, that the brain essentially cleanses itself of metabolic waste products. Now, the, 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 the non-REM phases are also important in their own right and are very uh, essential to, to cardiometabolic health. And these tables on each side give us the different characteristics of non-REM and REM sleep. Non-REM sleep makes up about 75 to 80% of total sleep time. These are the th three stages. The brain waves, the, the frequency of the EEG is, is relatively slow, as opposed to the high frequency that we see during wakefulness and during REM sleep. And it's during non-REM sleep that we have a fall in heart rate, a fall in blood pressure, and a fall in breathing frequency. REM makes up only 20 to 25% of total sleep time. The brain waves are fast, similar to wakefulness, 
Heart rate and blood pressure are very labile and often uh, increase rapidly. Breathing is regular. Muscle atonia occurs, and that muscle atonia prevents us from acting out our dreams. We lose muscle tone, and therefore we are unable to, to act out whatever it is that we are dreaming about. And as you know, dream sleep and REM sleep are considered to a large extent synonymous. Now, when does REM sleep occur? This is the hypnogram showing when the different sleep stages occur over the time of falling asleep. This is when you fall asleep at night, and here's waking in the morning, and there's wakefulness shown there and there. And what is striking here is that REM essentially warms up. So the longer you sleep, the more frequent REM becomes, and importantly, the more sustained REM becomes. This means that if you only sleep four or five hours at night, you are actually missing out on your longest phases of REM sleep, which occur in the latter part of the night. And so it's essential to get a sustained period of sleep in order to best benefit from sustained periods of REM. Now, what happens during sleep? We've got a number of different uh, 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 physiologic uh, and regulatory changes that occur during sleep, and I've highlighted four of the ones that are probably most important to us from a cardiovascular and a metabolic perspective. During sleep, we have an increase in growth hormone, an increase in testosterone, and an increase in lipolysis. Importantly, we also have a decrease in insulin. And as you know, insulin is lipogenic, so this is in part tied to the reduction or the, the increase in lipolysis that occurs when insulin levels are lower. There are a number of other important things that happen during sleep also listed on this slide. Now, what happens if we don't get enough sleep? These are the, the, the health risks that have been linked to inadequate sleep. Hypertension, ischemic heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, epilepsy, and depression. So not getting enough sleep has been associated with a number of, 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 of um, uh, disease conditions. The mechanisms of this association, however, remain somewhat unclear. But before we get further into that, let's think about how much of a problem sleep deprivation really is. So when we look at the percentage of people who are significantly sleep deprived, we find that about 28% occasionally sleep deprived, 24% regularly, and about 11% are sleep deprived on a daily basis. And this is BFB, before Facebook. Now, we can imagine that with, with all of the, the uh, uh, social media that's available and the fact that we tend to catch up on correspondence, particularly at night, the likelihood of sleep deprivation has increased significantly. Now, how does less sleep link to disease conditions? So on the left, we see the occurrence of sleep deprivation in different states. And the darker the blue, the more severe the sleep deprivation is in that given state. Now, when you look at obesity, you find that the dark blue, the significantly sleep deprived, tends to correlate with the dark brown, which is the, the, the um, uh, regions, which, which represents the regions with the highest likelihood of obesity. So just looking at data from the CDC, there's this impression that areas that are sleep deprived are also areas that tend to be more obese. And they tend to, to overlap with, with some uniformity. Now, if you look at a clinic population, we get the same message that overweight and obese patients in a primary care population tend to report less sleep than patients who have a normal BMI. Again, a, a, an observational relationship. Now, this relationship holds true even when we look at the NHANES data, and NHANES represents a, a sample of the U.S. population that's balanced for age, 
sex, um, and other demographics, including race and ethnicity. And you find that from Enhanes in 84, 87, and 92, that the same consistent relationship is evident, that sleep duration shown on the horizontal axis and BMI, an index of BMI shown on the vertical axis, are related in that people who sleep less on the left-hand side tend to have higher BMIs, and people who have longer sleep, shown on the right, tend to have BMIs that are closer to what, what we would uh, regard as normal. So are there any experimental data that, that could help explain some of this, this observational, uh, some of these observational findings. These are data from a study done a few years ago where we took healthy, normal people and we admitted them to the hospital. We acclimated them for three days and three nights, and then they were randomized either to sleep deprivation of about four to five hours per night of sleep versus ad lib sleep and then a recovery period for four days and three nights. And essentially what, what we did was the typical time in bed, if you were randomized to normal sleep, was 10 p.m. and you were woken up at 6 a.m. If you were randomized to deprivation, you went to sleep at around 1 a.m. and woken up at 6 a.m., which gave you about 5.3 hours um, uh, in bed. And this is a representation of caloric intake, which we monitored very closely in the sleep-deprived group and in the control group. And what was clear was that the people who were sleep-deprived had a significant increase in calorie intake compared to baseline, whereas the ones who were sleeping ad lib as much as they wanted had, if anything, a slight tendency towards a decrease. And the sleep-deprived group actually manifested an increase in weight of about 1.1 kilograms after the eight days of sleep restriction. Now, what else happened is that endothelial function became impaired. Here we see data on uh, uh, endothelial function measured in the control group in blue and in the sleep-deprived group in orange, and flow-mediated dilation which is a measure of the endothelial cell's ability to produce nitric oxide, was significantly impaired in the people randomized to sleep deprivation versus those who were randomized to normal sleep. Now, how do these physiologic findings link to actual clinical uh, disease conditions? These are data from, from NHANES following up people with a sleep duration of five hours or less, and they had a two-fold increased likelihood in risk of high blood pressure. Now, it's not just high blood pressure that may be um, uh, uh, increased in sleep deprivation. If we look at the Women's Health Study, looking at more than 70,000 middle-aged women followed up over 10 years and looking at incident or new onset coronary artery disease, what they found was that for women who slept eight hours, given a relative risk of one of new onset coronary artery disease, those who slept five hours had almost a double the risk of incident coronary artery disease. Again, so we've seen that, that people who sleep less on an epidemiologic basis tend to be carrying more weight that people who sleep less tend to eat more and possibly then have a likelihood of gaining weight, that people who sleep less have impaired endothelial function, and that people who sleep less have an increased risk of not just high blood pressure, but also of new onset coronary artery disease. Now, we've talked about sleep and cardiovascular health, but it would be remiss of me not to remind you that there is a more general consideration that we need to take into account when we think of impaired sleep. So let's look at Fairfax, Virginia, where only 6% of 10th graders and 3% of 12th graders get their required eight and a half to nine hours of sleep. Two out of every three teens there were severely sleep deprived, 
with an increased likelihood of high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity, and also uh, evidence of, of, of some increased likelihood of depression and suicide. So let's look at car crashes. We'll compare here Virginia Beach, where school starts at 7.20 in the morning, and Chesapeake, where school starts at 8.40 in the morning, an hour and 20 minutes later. There were 41% more car crashes among 16 to 18-year-olds in Virginia Beach versus Chesapeake, suggesting that not only is impaired sleep linked to obesity, to high blood pressure, to coronary artery disease, but also to other concerns in teenagers, including an increased likelihood of motor vehicle accidents. So take home points are that sleep, sleep occupies about a third of our life and is essential to health and well-being. That inadequate sleep is increasingly pervasive, a deficiency exacerbated by social networks. There are substantial epidemiologic and experimental data linking poor sleep to increased risk of obesity, hypertension, and coronary artery disease. And that poor sleep is also linked to workplace and motor vehicle accidents. And thank you for your attention. I hope this talk has been of some help.